Well, welcome everybody who's here in person and our online participants um, to the final presentation for this year's University of Washington Data Science for Social Good program. Uh, my name is Sarah Stone and I'm the executive director of the UW eScience Institute, which has hosted this DSSG program each summer since its inception in 2015. So this is our ninth year. I was just counting it out on my fingers earlier. <laughs> I messed it up the first time, but I got it right the second time. Um, the eScience Institute, which is the host organization um, for this program, um, serves as a hub for data intensive discovery um, on the UW campus and beyond, where we work with researchers from across all fields um, to use data science and AI tools and techniques to accelerate their research. Um, this DSSG program is one of our several core programs um, that we run throughout the year. And I would just encourage anybody who's interested um, to sign up on our webpage, on the homepage for the eScience Institute to learn more about what we're doing. Um, we see this DSSG program really as an exploratory space where we engage with how to use data science for good, really thinking of this as a layered and complex undertaking. The student fellows who are part of this program receive technical training in data science methods and best practices, um, but also we include ethical discussions and reflections and really encourage students to consider the impacts of this work from different angles throughout the program and as the project as the projects um, progress. Um, today, you're going to have the opportunity to hear from our eight DSSG student fellows um, who come from universities across the United States and really bring their diverse backgrounds and disciplines um, to bear um, in this program and in their projects. Um, they spent the last 10 weeks working in highly collaborative <laughs> and intense <laughs> and very fun, it looks like, collaborative project teams. Um, we would like to ask you both in the audience here and online to hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Um, each team will take questions following their presentations. We have two presentations, so there'll be a Q&A after each one. Um, for online participants, um, please drop your questions in the Zoom Q&A. Um, these questions and on-site audience questions will be repeated so that everybody has the opportunity to engage and understand what the question is. Um, so without further ado, um, let's get started and welcome our first team who will be presenting on Flowing Forward, a Reproducible Workflow for Studying Groundwater Scarcity in the Colorado River Basin. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our project presentation. I am Violet, and today I'm presenting together with my teammates, Kim, Ancho, and Maya. And our project leads are Akshay and Samir. Our engagement lead is Linda, and our data scientist is Wang. So let's talk about water. We are in contact with water every day. We drink water, we bathe with water, and we engage with water activities, especially for folks in Seattle during the summer. But water is also an integral part of our lives in ways that are often hidden. We use water to generate power. We use water to grow agricultural produces, and we use it to produce microchips that are carried in our phones and laptops. We use water in so many ways, but only a small fraction of the total water on earth is fresh water that we can use. This water exists as surface water stored in streams and lakes above the earth land surface, as snowpacks um, often found on mountaintops, as moisture in soil and groundwater, which is the focus of our project. So what exactly is groundwater? Groundwater is the fresh water stored in the ground beneath the earth's surface in the saturated zones as pictured on the slides here. So imagine a sponge soaked with water. In this case, the earth in the saturated zone is a sponge and water from precipitation and other sources travels down from the surface and gather in a saturated zone, where all the pores between rocks and soils are filled with water. And this becomes groundwater. Groundwater is an extremely important source of water. Over half of the US population relies on groundwater for drinking, and this number goes up to nearly 100% for rural communities. And arid communities are especially reliant on groundwater and people extract groundwater by pumping them through the wells that are shown in the slides. 
So in the US, groundwater is used for over 40% of irrigation and provides more than 60% of the water used for livestock purposes. Groundwater also plays an important role in the hydrological cycle. It contributes to the flows of rivers and streams and lakes that are habitats for plants and animals. The time it takes for groundwater to replenish varies, but it can take thousands of years, making groundwater an absolute critical and scarce resource. Even so, groundwater has been largely out of sight, out of mind in many water manage management practices due to its lack of visibility and the difficulty in measuring groundwater. This means that in some places, people could be taking more groundwater than it can replenish, which could have a number of consequences, such as reduction in agricultural yield and land sinking. Okay, so I wanna now uh, turn to discuss water scarcity, which is when demand for fresh water exceeds the supply of fresh water. Uh, so more specifically, it refers to the, the situation where there's an insumount insufficient amount of clean and safe water available to meet the needs of a specific region's population. So as you can see from the map uh, on the right, water scarcity is a global problem with many countries uh, projected to have high or extremely high water stress levels in 2040. Um, so water stress, stress is defined as the projected ratio of water withdrawals to water supply. Um, and many of the countries, as you can see on the map in the mid latitude area um, of the globe, are projected to have high or extremely high projected water stress levels. Um, so some key drivers of water scarcity across the globe include climate change, uh, population growth, pollution, and inefficient uh, water management practices. Uh, so the Colorado River Basin is a more specific example of an area uh, that's facing significant water scarcity. Um, so on this slide, you can see uh, several news headlines from the last few years uh, highlighting uh, the severity of the problem within the region. So a few key points that I really want to emphasize here on this slide, um, that the region saw its first ever water, water shortage in history declared. Um, drastic cuts to current water usage must be made in order for there to be sustainable management of the river. And climate change, inequitable water distribution, and demand growth are key drivers of water scarcity in the region. Um, so where and what exactly is the Colorado River Basin? So the Colorado River Basin, as you can see on the slide, um, is a large area in the American Southwest uh, surrounding the Colorado River, spanning seven US states, two states in Mexico, and 30 tribal nations. So as you can see on the map, uh, it's divided into upper and lower basins at Lee's Ferry. Um, and this is as a result of historical agreements in 1922 among the Colorado River Basin states. Um, so these agreements mandated that uh, the two basins equally share water and focused on uh, surface water management primarily. Um, and a focus, this is a focus that has stubbornly persisted today. Um, so the upper basin uh, with its more mountainous region uh, contributes much, much of the water to the Colorado River Basin um, from melting snowpack each year. So the river is economically, socially, and culturally very important. Um, it serves 40 million people. Oop, sorry about that. Um, serves 40 million people, provides irrigation for uh, five and a half uh, million acres of land, and supports close to one and a half trillion dollars in uh, annual economic activity. Um, so despite its importance, uh, groundwater has largely been left out of policy decisions in the Colorado River Basin. So um, as previously mentioned, this is partly because of some rigid policy structures that were put in place as a result of these 1922 compacts. Um, and another key reason is that uh, it's because groundwater is less visible and can be difficult to measure. Um, so historically, uh, people have relied on well measurements, which are expensive um, and uh, result in less frequent measurements. Um, so more specifically, these measurements require first constructing a well, which is in and of itself expensive, uh, then installing a measuring mechanism, and then collecting, analyzing, and storing uh, data. So the measurements are, are limited to the frequency uh, at which measurements can be taken and the locations of the wells uh, themselves. So I wanna point now um, to the right-hand side picture here, which shows um, a bathtub ring at Reflection Canyon uh, in June, 2021 in Lake Powell, um, and really emphasize here uh, the surface water component, which has largely been the focus of a lot of previous policy decisions. 
Um, so as mentioned in the slide, the 2007 interim guidelines uh, were a set of guidelines established to manage uh, water during drought and water scarcity in the region. And these guidelines focus primarily on surface water management. Uh, so they don't give guidance for how uh, states should manage groundwater. And they're set to expire in 2026, uh, making information on groundwater uh, particularly crucial. Um, so turning now to just sum up uh, what we have so far. So groundwater is a crucial freshwater resource. Um, it's often been ignored in policy decisions and political contexts. Um, measuring groundwater has also historically been expensive, infrequent, and confined to well rotate well locations um, and water crises are becoming more commonplace uh, in the US and across the globe. So sustainable water and especially sustainable groundwater management practices are essential. And to put it simply, you can't manage what you can't measure. Um, and so our project using data from NASA's GRACE mission can help fill this, this groundwater gap. So what exactly is this GRACE mission? As technology advanced, NASA, in collaboration with the German Space Agency, launched two satellites in space in a mission named GRACE, which stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. In this mission, these satellites, separated by 137 miles apart, orbit around the Earth to detect changes in Earth's gravity fields using GPS and microwave ranging systems. These satellites measure changes in the pull of gravity, which refers to how water is shifting around the Earth due to changing seasons, weather, and climate processes. By measuring gravity changes, GRACE showed how mass is distributed around the planet and how it varies over time. Data from the GRACE satellite uh, serves as an important tool because after doing modeling and statistical analysis, you can calculate the entire water that is stored on the Earth. And if you uh, combine it with other data sets like we did, you can also calculate groundwater in every other region of the Earth. So uh, to calculate groundwater, there are different components of water that are required. So we have talked about total water storage that GRACE can give us, but there's also other components like soil moisture, snow water, and surface water. We can derive uh, soil moisture and snow water from GLADIS, which is a data set which stands for Global Land Data Assimilation Systems. And then there is surface water from reservoirs, which we can get from USGS, which stands for United States Geological Survey, and USBR, which is United States Bureau of Reclamation. But the process to compute groundwater is complicated. To use any data, there are three steps that are involved. You have to download the data, you have to process the data, and you have to, you have to be able to interpret the data. There are challenges involved in every step in an, uh, with these data sets. So in order to download the data set, if you just search the word GRACE on NASA's Earth engine, there are 145 matching data sets with that search. The GLADIS, which contains the soil moisture and snow water, has monthly measurements, daily measurements, hourly measurements, but you would need probably yearly measurements of soil moisture and snow water. That ends up being like 10,000 plus files for only one year. There are also multiple variables in a single file. And for processing these data sets, these data sets exist in different units, resolutions, frequencies. They also exist in a geospatial format, which many social science researchers are not used to. Finally, even if you can download and process these data sets, understanding these data sets is another challenge. The numbers are present in changes rather than fixed numbers. So basically what I wanna highlight is that there is zero detailed guide to calculate groundwater for non-experts. So this is where we come in. Our contribution is that we build a flexible and well-documented workflow that can easily be used to study groundwater changes in the Colorado River Basin and other regions. One of the primary objective of this project is to establish clear and effective documentation accessible to our project leads, as well as researchers or varying technical background. The aim is to produce reproducibility of the workflow beyond what we have achieved here in these 10 weeks. And to do so, we have created markdown files and notebooks, which are available on our website and updated on the GitHub repository, which ensures widespread access and availability. We have also created our workflow thinking about our potential users and interested groups. Our potential use, primary potential user are the researchers. Uh, we believe that our workflow can help them in, uh, increase their efficiency in allowing them to understand the study of groundwater more effectively. We also believe that our secondary users are policymakers, advocacy uh, groups, and general public. The insights that can be gained from the data uh, used in our workflow 
can help and help distribute policy making decisions, as well as about water allocation decisions, and could also educate the general public about water scarcity and groundwater changes in Colorado River Basin. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the workflow that we have created. So our workflow consists of different multiple um, markdown files and codes, and basically these are the steps that uh, our workflow consists of. It helps you find the right data set of interest. It helps you download the data of interest as well as process the data, apply the equation which is needed to compute groundwater, and finally visualize the trends. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through some example outputs of our workflow um, and highlight the types of questions that you can answer with these outputs. So say that we have a researcher named Martha. Now she lives in the Colorado River Basin, specifically in Arizona, um, a state that um, relies heavily on groundwater. Now she has some technical chops and she's interested in how groundwater moves and how it can be computed. Um, so in order to calculate the change in groundwater, she'll need several variables. So the first is terrestrial water storage, as mentioned previously, this is the summation of all water on earth. Now, the next one she needs is snow water equivalent, which is the amount of water available in snow that is packed um, in areas such as mountains. She'll additionally need the root zone soil moisture, which is just the water that is available to plants underground. And then finally, she needs surface water, which is the water found on Earth's surface that we can easily see, such as within our rivers and within our ponds. Now, you'll notice that we say changes or anomalies a lot, um, like mentioned with Grace. Um, but that can be a little confusing, so I'll walk you through it. Um, so if you look at the graph here on the left, we have the raw data graphed in gray, and then the mean over this time series is graphed in pink. Now, if you compute the distance um, for each point in the raw data from the mean and plot those points, then you get deviation from the mean. And that is the form that our data is in. Um, so Grace doesn't measure the total or absolute water storage, but rather you think of it as mass changes. And so we typically don't know the value that it's changing from, and so we create a reference point. And so using the equation mentioned previously, I'll walk through some examples of the figures that Martha, the researcher, might produce. Um, I want to note that these are preliminary analyses, and so we're still in the process of validation. Now this shows... Um, this slide shows a plot of groundwater anomaly in the Colorado River Basin over time. Um, the x-axis is time, um, and the granularity is in months, while the y-axis is groundwater volume um, in kilometers cubed. And one kilometer cubed is just over 400,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools, so that gives you a sort of idea of the scale of water that we're dealing with. Um, and so aside from the seasonal and annual trends that you can see, we additionally observe a downward trend starting just after 2012. Now, even when we compute a 12 month moving average to eliminate these annual trends, we can see that groundwater does continue to deplete over time. And such a plot could bring out a sense of urgency for a researcher like Martha. Um, now, as mentioned previously, our groundwater anomaly plot is averaged over the entire Colorado River Basin, but using our workflow, a, re a researcher can look at a specific point of, in time over the entire basin. Now, for example, um, in October 2003, we noticed a significant drop in groundwater. Um, we can look at the spatial distribution of the groundwater anomaly for a singular point in time, um, and that makes sense why the point is so low because we see so many red values. Now, conversely, we can take a look at a very wet month, such as May 2011. Now, we observe higher groundwater storage in the upper basin, which makes sense because the area is more mountainous. And then we see that the lower basin does remain drier even during a wet year, um, which makes sense because the lower basin is more desert-like. Now, speaking of the upper and lower basin, um, we can using our workflow, look at individual basins and their trends over time. Now, the division between the basins was, divided politi was decided politically, but it turns out that the upper basin is a crucial water source for the lower basin. And so we observe that even though there is still this downward trend over time for both the upper and lower basin, it's more significant um, within the lower basin. So Martha went from all of this complicated data to digestible figures that she can draw conclusions from. And now Martha, armed with this um, and new information, can empower individuals within her community to advocate for sustainable groundwater practices and policies. Now, unfortunately, the Colorado River Basin is not unique in that it's facing significant water stress. Um, as mentioned in 
previously, these crises are happening all over the world. So just a few examples, the state of Bihar in India is experiencing decreased rainfall and decline in groundwater levels. And the country of Egypt in Africa will have very exacerbated water crises um, in the very near future. Um, and so we hope that our tool can empower researchers across the globe. And so in summary, um, the two takeaway messages we, want to, we really want to drill home are that groundwater is important, but extremely hard to measure. And our workflow um, thankfully simplifies this process um, to study groundwater. Um, if you want to find out more about our project, you can visit our website linked here. Um, and not only is there more information about the background and the motivation, but also um, access to our GitHub, which has um, detailed workflow in the form of notebooks and markdowns. And we're working to have this finalized by the end of the week. Um, and we want to say thank you to so many people for help and support throughout this project. We'll take any questions. Yes. Well, I'm looking at the ability to measure groundwater where it is. Um, I can see how it's like maybe you notice how it's dipped. Are there anything that you found in your research stuff I did like a couple of policy ideas to help stand a lot with the groundwater? Oh, so the question um, was in the course of our research, uh, did we find any types of policy interventions that uh, could help address the groundwater declines? Um, so one uh, part of our project that was really um, useful and interesting for us was the uh, opportunity to talk with stakeholders in the area. Um, so one key thing that came up in talking with our stakeholders, um, and we spoke with people from um, the Nature Conservancy, um, advocacy groups such as that, um, and researchers who are really familiar with the area. Um, but one, one thing that came to mind, and I'll see if any of my teammates want to add anything else, but um, one of the big users of water in the region is agriculture. So thinking about how to have more sustainable agricultural practices. Um, and I think one of the big key drivers is um, like alfalfa and grass and food for cows and livestock in particular. Um, so thinking about ways for more efficient irrigation, um, other types of sustainable practices, that was one that came up across all the stakeholders we, we spoke with. Yeah, I think to add on to that, one thing we realized when we talked to our stakeholders was that uh, since groundwater is such a complicated process to be able to understand and compute it, uh, there's a lot of reluctance to be able to actually like see the impact it has. Uh, and that's why uh, through this workflow, we're trying to push that conversation further. And we hope that it is pushed forward by the 2026 negotiations. But we saw that there is a little bit of reluctance right now in even thinking about how groundwater is important in uh, the CRB region. So you focus on the Colorado River, and is that due to data that we use? And like, would this model apply elsewhere? I think it's all kind of brushing up and focusing on that particular. Um, so the question was, um, what was the rationale for focusing on the Colorado River Basin in particular, and if it can be applied to other regions? Um, so the data sets we're working with, uh, the uh, Grace data and Gladys data, uh, those are global data sets, so you can use them to apply to um, other regions as long as you have a shapefile of the region you're interested in, in studying or a sense of the lat longs you want to focus on. Um, the surface water data we have is only for the U.S., um, so that would have to be region specific. Um, but we chose to focus on the Colorado River Basin uh, because it's a region that's particularly pressing right now um, in terms of upcoming policy decisions and also just the water crisis that the region's facing um, and the, the reliance on groundwater within the region. Um, so it's very important for rural communities, arid communities, and um, Arizona in particular is a state that um, is heavily reliant on groundwater, also for um, uh, just urban development there as well. And we're grateful for our project leads and our engagement lead for um, pitching this project. And I think that like a big part of it is that this like water crisis is so unprecedented um, and that it is very timely with the 2026 negotiations coming up. Do you want to add? 
Uh, I just want to say that there are multiple equations that exist for computing groundwater, which and some of the equations don't involve surface water. So if other parts of the uh, world you want to compute groundwater without the surface water part of the equation, uh, our workflow would be helpful in finding groundwater in other regions of the world too. <laughs> I noticed in your, in your piece of the top showing like where on the underground, but there were a few places that sort of were opposite of the trends nearby them. And I was wondering if that was a physicality issue, if you weren't necessarily what was going on there. Right. Yeah. So um, we we figured we get this question. <laughs> oh, so sorry. Um. Yeah. So the question is, um, on the spatial plots, there are some pixels that sort of seem different or opposite from the pixels around them. And so those are the locations where there are wells, and we're getting um, or like there are reservoirs, and so we're getting uh, measures of surface water. And so, for example, if you're measuring um, like Lake Mead, mm -hmm. it's going to be really significant. And uh, so our pixel granularity is 0.25. And so that's about 17 miles long, even though like Lake Mead is over 100 miles long. Mm -hmm. And so it's um, a single point that represents um, that entire body of water, of surface water. And then um, we sort of think of that as future work to do like some so sort of- like over subtracted or, or something like that in the in your equation. One pixel is the big spread across all the pixels that are like- Right. Um, and it, it does smooth out when you average over the Colorado River Basin, but when you do do these spatial plots, they, yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. We have time for just one more question. I'd like to take a question from the uh, non okay. participants. Those of you here in the room, save your questions that, that you didn't get to ask for the reception. Um, so there's a question, how granular can the region be within US county, city, or pixel resolution of great satellite data? Right. So the question was um, how granular you can get with GRACE data? Yes, within US county, city, or pixel resolution. Right, so specifically within the US. And so I think it depends on the data set that you're using. Um, and as Anshul mentioned, there are so many data sets. Um, but the data set that we used was uh, half a degree for GRACE, and then we upsampled to be um, a quarter of a degree to match with the GLADIS data. Yeah. So to give a sense, as I mentioned before, um, the pixels are half a degree by half a degree. So it's about 17 miles by 17 miles. Um, so that's uh, the, yeah, the lowest granularity that um, you can go. So for um, our region, uh, generally, we that tended to be um, pretty good for us because the basin is really large. But if you're looking at basins that are you know significantly smaller, it might pose some specific issues I should think about. Right. So yeah, a quarter degree is about 17 miles, and then so a half a degree would be about like 30 something. Well, thank you so much. Wonderful job, you guys. Um, let's move on to our next team. Um, I invite you to guys to come and join me at the podium. Um, and um, they'll be talking about heat pumps in Alaska and beyond. Hi, everyone. Thank you for um, attending our presentation. Um, so for our project, uh, we'll be focusing in on the question, where can heat pumps meet heating needs in Alaska's cold climate? Um, and I'm Catherine, and I'll be presenting with my teammates, Silas, Amina, and Brian. Um, so decarbonization is a pressing global issue, and the Arctic is an area of particular concern. So in Alaska, um, warming is occurring at four times the global rate, and thermal energy, which is primarily fossil fuel-based, represents about 75% of energy consumption in the Arctic. So transitioning to cleaner and more energy efficient heating methods offers an immense opportunity to reduce carbon emissions and help combat climate change. Um, and heat pumps offer this energy efficient solution. So in contrast to traditional heating sources that often require burning fossil fuels to generate heat, um, air source heat pumps extract heat from the environment. So even in colder temperatures, they're able to extract heat from the air outside and push it indoors to heat a home or a building, essentially working like an air conditioner in reverse. Um, and this means that they produce um, more heat than the electricity that they use, making them about two to five times more energy efficient than traditional electric resistance heating. Um, and if the electricity used by a heat pump comes from renewable resources like um, wind or solar, then the operation can be nearly carbon free. 
Um, but despite heat pumps offering this great energy efficient solution, um, Alaska is slow to transition to getting their heating needs met by heat pumps. So in Alaska, only about 1% of households um, are estimated to have a heat pump compared to the national average of around 15%. So why does Alaska have such low adoption rates? Um, one primary factor is a concern that heat pumps won't be able to heat um, to, to meet the heating needs in the cold Alaskan climate. So because heat pumps transfer heat instead of generating it, they become less efficient at extremely low temperatures um, when there isn't enough heat in the outside air to extract. And this is a very real concern um, as some parts of Alaska can have nights as cold as negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. Um, and just a note here, because the efficiency, oh, sorry about that. Um, because the efficiency of a heat pump directly relates to its heating feasibility um, for the purposes of this presentation, we'll use those terms interchangeably. Um, and another concern in switching to heat pumps is uncertainty about how cost effective this would be at the household level. So in other words, is the money that could be saved in efficiency um, worth the um, initial costs of installing and maintaining a heat pump? Um, and this brings us to the primary question that we hope to address in our project. Um, where can heat pumps meet heating needs in Alaska's cold climate? So current work regarding heat pumps in Alaska focuses on the impact of a heat pump in a single home or heat pumps tested under lab conditions. We build on this work to create community level analyses that look at the impact of heat pumps within a region. Transitioning to greener heating is a complex problem that needs to be addressed at an individual level by homeowners and at a community or regional level by policymakers, local organizations, and housing authorities. Our work aims to help groups making large-scale policy decisions answer where in Alaska heat pumps will work and where they should target their resources. Um, our goal for this project is to create map-based visualizations that explore both heat pump adoption and potential in Alaska. We create and visualize what-if scenarios for heat pump adoption. Uh, we also run simulations to estimate the economic, technical, and green impacts of installing heat pumps. So that one goal sounds very nice and succinct, but I'd like to tease out two parallel workflows that we created. The first looks at statewide adoption and makes unchanging assumptions about the world that we live in today. For adoption, we're interested in knowing where heat pumps are now, where they will likely be in the future, and we want to quantify an opportunity gap between the two. The second hidden goal is borough potential. This goal comes with changing and interacting assumptions. We investigate heat pump potential given different fossil fuel price changing scenarios, government subsidies, and varying levels of climate change. So to start, we discussed with energy and utility experts in Alaska what the current landscape of heat pump adoption looks like. There was no one source that we could go to to get this information, so we compiled a new data set based on these expert opinions. The numbers that we arrived at aren't perfect, but um, because many heat pump installers and homeowners don't get permits and there isn't a house to house inventory of heat pumps. So we end up pulling from permits, installer records and knowledge of general trends and demand curated by organizations like Alaska Heat Smart and the Chugach Electric Association. And we come up with our estimate of about 1% of homes have heat pumps in Alaska today. So from that 1% estimate, we chose 5% and 15% as goal numbers for our adoption scenarios. Uh, representatives of the Alaska Housing Finance Corporation agree that 5% adoption in the next 10 years is within the realm of possibility, whereas that 15% number, the U.S. national average of heat pump adoption, is more aspirational. With these goals in mind, we went about distributing heat pumps by borough using a proportional allocation algorithm. This algorithm was developed and is typically used to distribute parliamentary seats according to votes. But in our case, we distributed heat pumps according to average heat pump efficiency and population. We greatly weighted heat pump efficiency over population because we believe this is the most important factor in determining heat pump adoption. After all, if a heat pump can't heat your home, why get one? Our adoption scenarios are not meant to be predictions. 
Um, instead, they're an imagining exercise for what heat pump adoption could look like, allowing us to explore that opportunity gap I mentioned earlier, the gap between what currently exists and what is possible. Okay. So in addition to the statewide adoption, we consider how each pump impact changes given different economic and climate conditions. We allow for changes in floor price, government rebates, and temperature. So these changes can be seen on their own and in combination with one another. So we believe these changes represent some of the most important and most likely changes that would occur. Uh, we build, uh, floor prices, especially natural gas, I expected to increase beyond typical inflation. New rebate as part of the Inflation Reduction Act will go into effect this year. And like we mentioned, the Arctic is facing global warming at a much higher rate than the rest of the world. So you want to know the impacts of using heat pumps if, this if these changes occur. So to get a measure of our estimate, that is uh, feasibility in terms of eating days covered, economic savings and the amount of carbon saved. We relied mainly on the heat pump calculator. So the heat pump calculator uh, was designed by Alan Mitchell from Anal Analysis Notes. So it is a great tool for measuring all these estimates for buildings. So the heat pump calculator takes in climate data as input. And our way of, of optimizing this tool is that we incorporated the use of a more granular data from the Google Earth engine. So the heat pump allows users to like directly change assumptions from some variables, including uh, fuel type, fuel prices, and government subsidies. So we take advantage of this when running our different simulations. And we also adjusted the underlying data uh, by adjusting our temperature data. So we calculated the differences in average temperatures from 1980 to 2009 and 2010 to 23, and used simple extrapolation to adjust the temperature data used by the calculator in some of our simulations. So like we mentioned, the heat form calculator is a great tool, but it only gives estimates for a building at a time. So if you want like a bro level estimate, you probably want to use our tool. I mean, you definitely want to use our tool. <laughs> so this slide here is just to show you a workflow, uh, the workflow we followed. So we, uh, we make some assumptions and simulations from the calculator. We get the estimates for a particular building. And then we weigh each city by the number of households in, uh, in the city and the type of world those homes use. And this uh, all meeting for data is gotten from the US census and American community survey. And then we aggregate over a borough. So we get our borough estimates. So after a series of engagement with our stakeholders, we decided the diagram is the best kind of visualization we can use for our estimates. So in an argument of weighing people over land or land over people, uh, the diagram gives a good solution to this. Uh, so the area of each region, such as the borough, is not drawn to scale, rather it is resized by population. So the aim is to represent data on a per region basis, but in a way that reflects the value of the data rather than the, rather than the geographical uh, size of that region. So we know Alaska is geographically wide, it's very big, but it has a very low population density. So to the right here is a diagram of the US 2014 elec uh, US 2004 election. Uh, this is just to show you that it's not something we came up with. It's as always been out there. Uh -huh. And then the thing is that this type of visualization aids in providing meaningful insight in a situation where the land size is not proportional to the number of people on the land. So after all, people who adopt it pump, not land. So next, you're going to have a demo of our visualization tool. Now we are very excited to show you our interactive tool that is online, open source, and publicly available right now. Let me do a quick demo about how our users can engage with our interactive tool. And I have to reload this because it's been sitting for a while. 
This is an interactive tool that we have built uh, upon our Shiny and Plotly to make it interactive and publicly uh, open source. And it's still loading right now. <laughs> Perfect. So here in the introduction page, we give the, uh, the users a motivation about why do we care about Hippom, uh, suggest how they can navigate with our dashboard, and also orient them uh, to uh, one of our main visualization tool, that is the Tilegram. So here on the left-hand side, you see Alaska being represented in a traditional map. For example, you can see Anchorage, one of the uh, uh, bigger cities that has the largest population, is being buried by other big borough that simply has larger geographical size. But it doesn't do justice to the fact that he has one of the most, uh, you know, uh, largest population in Alaska. On the right hand side, you have a telegram that represents Alaska in a different way. We create that from the Alaska Department of Labor and Workforce Research uh, uh, Development Research. And uh, we also make the underlying grid data available. So if you are a researcher in Alaska, feel free to download them and use them. So you see that we do a better, a better job in terms of doing justice to the fact that Anchorage has much more population than other you know, geographically larger region. So this telegram is gonna show up in our uh, visualization recurrently. So let's look at adoption rate at a statewide level, our first goal. We know that Alaska heat pump adoption rate are very low right now, around uh, sitting around 1%. What if the scenario changed to 5%? So we can actually toggle between different uh, projection scenario. You can say 5%, you didn't see much change, but you can actually hover over individual borrow and get the individual borrow data. For example, you can see Anchorage here have 200 uh, heat pump being installed. It sounds small. Uh, let's be a little bit more ambitious and hit the national average of 15%. Now you see a whole different scenario where heat pump being much more widely available in Alaska. You can also toggle between relative versus absolute uh, number. Now you can see that we actually in the pen handle region, imagine a pen, this is the handle. This is uh, usually what people refer Southeast Alaska to, uh, including important cities such as Juneau. They are, the heat pump there are much more uh, highly concentrated in those regions. And I think it does a great job of uh, telling that, you know, our algorithm reflects certain reality because the Southeast region has been one of the pioneer in adopting heat pump. And they are also likely gonna be the leader in leading this uh, heat pump adoption effort. So I think we are pretty happy about the result of the algorithm, but also we can, Imagine, right, in the 15% scenario, which uh, borough are you sitting at and what will the scenario, scenario look like? And how do we uh, imagine our user will use this information? There are two things. So the first thing is that we hope this information is going to help local NGO and housing authority uh, in different boroughs to anticipate future demand because they are planning their annual subsidization program. They are planning their educational program yearly. If they are empowered with this tool, they can ant actually anticipate demand and advocate for better resources allocated to their region and also educate their local homeowner or constituency about potential future demand. And also there are a lot of players involved in making heat pump adoption possible. Uh, installer, uh, distributor, uh, technician that are involved in the ecosystem, they actually also want to know the information. We know from interviews that uh, one of the bottleneck is actually logistic. Uh, to get an installer, a heat pump installer in your region, you might have to wait for four months. So I think anticip anticipating that future demand is very important because it allows other users to coordinate and to kind of uh, preempt uh, you know, uh, other uh, future demand and uh, in regions that you know, the demand might be high. So we also show that uh, in total aggregate, uh, we can see 97% of the heating day will be covered by heat pump according to our simulation. Uh, $169 million is gonna be saved due to the superior efficiency of heat pump. And also 144 millions of pounds of CO2 are gonna be saved if we uh, can achieve that aspirational goal. So let's look at the second functionality, which is heat pump potential, uh, bore, uh, uh, especially at a borrow level. Uh, and the telegram, it shows that uh, the net present value, which is defined as the economic efficiency of adopting a heat pump over its lifespan, minus the installation cost and electricity cost, uh, where the blue region show that it make economic sense and the red region uh, reflect that it might not make economic sense. But that is highly dependent on the fact that a lot of uh, Anchorage, uh, uh, cities like Anchorage are relying on very cheap fuel uh, source such as natural gas that is currently very cheap. And that scenario might change uh, given what we have discussed. Fuel price, especially fossil fuel, if you're leaving Seattle, gas is rising at a, a daily level. It hit $5 yesterday and I'm pretty mad about it. But the idea is that what if fuel price continue to increase? What if fossil price, what if another Ukraine war hit and suddenly there is a spike in uh, natural gas or oil? 
So you can actually toggle between different scenario and you can actually see some of the region turn from red to blue. It show that there's actually potential for HIPAA adoption, not right now, but in future. And also you can uh, toggle between different subsidy po uh, projection. Let's say we are in the induction, ref uh, induction ref uh, inflation reduction app right now, which is 2000 test credit. Again, government subsidy plays a large role. And I think this tells a story and empower the local NGO to advocate in, uh, in front of federal agency or the local government that subsidy program help in their region. And there are a lot more cool features that I can talk about in this uh, website, but we don't have time. So I encourage you to check it out and also play around with uh, the tool uh, yourselves uh, after this presentation. And let me go back to the uh, presentation and take stock of what we have learned from our tool. So the main takeaway is this, right? So for 18 out of 30 borrow, 97% or more total heating day can actually be covered by HIPAA. So hopefully we can address some of the skepticism and concern uh, from local residents that HIPAA might not work in cold climate like in, in Alaska. And also we have shown that the Inflation Reduction Act works and makes HIPAA economic in more than five borrow compared to uh, a, a scenario if there is no uh, any government rebate. And also if we uh, if Alaska can reach the national average of 15%, there will be 140 million pounds of CO2 being saved. That helps the environmental and global warming. So this is, I think this too show that there's tremendous potential of HIPAA adoption in Alaska. Um, and there were, there were three aspects of our tool um, that were really important to us as we were designing it. Um, so first, we really wanted it to be interactive. It was important to us to allow users um, to actively engage with the, um, with the tool to see how different scenarios would change the map, allow them to hover over features they might be interested in. Um, second, it was important to us, our tool was accessible to a wide range of audiences. Um, so we did design it with a primary audience of uh, policymakers and NGOs in mind, but really we hope that it will be accessible to both technical and non-technical audiences. Um, and to achieve this, we did a few things like ensuring that our visualizations both conveyed the relevant information like population rather than space while remaining clear and easily interpretable um, and presenting information in multiple formats um, like in maps and numbers and bar charts. Um, and Third, it was important to us that both our tool and our workflow and code was freely and easily um, accessible online. Um, and rather than seeing this tool and project as a static and, and finished product, we do see our project as a, as a blueprint. And this flow chart summarizes our, our process for both our statewide adoption goal along the top and our borough potential goal along the bottom. Um, importantly, our stakeholders were really central in all of the stages of our, of our project, from shaping our goals to offering key technical resources um, to offering expert feedback about our, our, our visualizations. And so they're getting a, a central spot in this workflow. Um, and with this blueprint, we want to outline the areas of expansion. Um, so currently in progress is we are increasing the granularity of our climate data. Um, our group worked to produce more granular climate data for Alaska than what was being used previously. So using um, Google Earth Engine, we were able to obtain daily temperature data averaged across a 10 year time span for 12,000 census blocks or small distinct uh, census regions in Alaska. And we're currently in the process of incorporating this highly granular data into the heat pump calculator, which currently uses data from about 70 climate um, regions. Um, we also piloted an approach for obtaining hourly data at the block level. Um, this uh, increased precision in climate data will help as we expand our estimates to smaller community um, levels. Um, and in the future, um, periodic updates to the climate data and heat pump estimates um, estimates will be needed um, to ensure that as people adopt more heat pumps, these, these numbers are updated. Um, and finally, um, our framework offers the opportunity for functionality um, updates to our adoption scenarios and the heat pump calculator. Um, and these updates will become more apparent as more people use the tool and have a better understanding of what kinds of information they need to explore different scenarios and make these informed decisions. Um, so we really want this work to be expanded on by, by stakeholders, um, and we hope that people interested in contributing to the project will reach out to us.
Um, so we invite everybody to explore the app. It's um, online and available. You can feel free to scan the QR code or go to this link um, to check it out. Right now, we do recommend people view it on a computer to get the full functionality of the interactive maps. Um, so we really want to thank um, people who contributed to this project, especially Aaron and Maddie, our project lead and, and data scientist everybody um, at the eScience Institute, the other fellows for their input and support um, and all of our amazing stakeholders. Um, and we're happy to take any questions. A good segue from the last, from your, your, your last point. Um, so there's a question, first, great use of Shiny, great tool. What's the long-term plan for maintaining the tool? And if you can repeat the question. Uh, the question was, uh, how do we uh, imagine the tool being expand and continue to operate? I think the nice thing is that now it's publicly available online. Uh, many users can use it and suggest feedback. And not many of the update, there's many points where you can intervene and say, oh, I actually have a better estimate of the local uh, region. So I can actually submit some sort of input and we can update that. And also I think there are a lot to be done. We simulate the borough level estimate. There is a lot more granularity you can go into uh, such as blocks, such as block groups, or even zip code that is more interpretable. So there is a lot of uh, potential uh, kind of to be expanded. Uh, we hope that the open source workflow is going to attract researcher to either continue to work on them or some sort of uh, housing researcher or an NGO that can post it. Uh, we will very much uh, welcome sponsorship or co-hosting the website uh, together. We would love to kind of hopefully this tool is going to live beyond this time. So uh, it seemed like it's really interesting presentation. I love it. Um, it seemed like no matter what you do in terms of taxing um, Anchorage, you're not going to get a lot of uptake based on, on your model. Can you say what drives that? Is it is it kind of coverage in terms of number of days? Is it purely technology? Um, so the question is asking about Anchorage specifically and um, our future projections for it and how it seems like it was kind of low compared to other places. So um, Anchorage currently is using a lot of very cheap natural gas and the contract that they have with um, the gas company is going to expire in the next 10 years and that company has said they don't want to renew it. Um, this means that Anchorage is going to have to transition to other fuel sources. So we included that 9% um, fuel increase, but it could be even higher for Anchorage because liquid natural gas may need to be flown in or um, there's a pipe dream of a pipeline, but any solution for um, Anchorage getting a way to replace this cheap natural gas is not going to be cheap. So um, the like specific situation of Anchorage is very likely to change in the next 10 years to make heat pumps more economical. And that original adoption scenario right now, um, it is like not super um, economic and it's not um, like top 10 um, heating feasibility, but it's still a really great place to consider the um, adoption of heat pumps. Right. Just to add on that, uh, I think in uh, Anchorage, 80% of the household are using natural gas as the major heating fuel. And the fact that we scale our estimate by the heating fuel use distribution reflect that reality, right? So I think in our early pilot test, the estimate are much more optimistic because we didn't adjust to the fact that in, uh, in Anchorage, there are a lot, right. household, a lot more households using natural gas rather than electricity or oil, right? So I think the estimate do reflect some reality of the economic challenge there. But the, the, the answer is great in terms of the fuel price matching in the future. A really interesting presentation. Uh, what would it take to model it for other states? Like, for instance, if you have to model this for Washington State. The question was, uh, what does it take to model other state uh, using our workflow or model? Uh, we have an interesting conversation with Sarah today, actually, about installing a heat pump in uh, Seattle. Does that make economic sense? And also the fact that in uh, Inflation Reduction Act or in other federal agency, there are a lot more subsidy coming up to support green energy. I do think there is an interest about uh, using this same workflow and apply it to other regions. 
but it has to be maybe cold enough to create a challenge. Uh, uh, one interesting thing about, uh, about people adoption in the United States is actually the Southern state is driving heat pump adoption because heat pump can work both ways, acting as an air conditioner and also a heating source. So it makes much more economic sense if you are in an extremely hot uh, region in the summer, but also cold enough to uh, require heat pump in the winter. So those regions, actually Seattle also, in some sense, satisfy those criteria. So we can actually see uh, a lot of adoption. But I do agree. I think the unique challenge of Alaska is the climate and the population density and the cheap fuel price. In other states, the challenge might be less apparent, but I do think the, the, the tool should be able to transport to other states. I can take one more question from our mind, and this will have to be the last question. Those of you who are here, please um, feel free to connect with them at the reception afterwards. Um, this question is, how did you quantify the characteristics of each borough, such as which borough would be more likely to adopt and install heat pumps? Is it all geography? Are there other economic measures, for example, such as income involved in the calculation? So um, I'm just going to switch uh, forward to um, a slide that goes through the, the, the haunt method, okay, um, because this question is about, um, I don't even know what the question is about. <laughs> how did you quantify the characters of each borough? Yeah, about how, we, the, probably for the adoption scenarios, how were the boroughs um, like quantified? So we didn't take into account anything that this question um, offered such as like socioeconomic status of a borough or um, another one that would be really interesting would be like the ruralness of a borough. Um, we kind of took that one into account in terms of population, um, but this is a really simple method to go ahead and distribute heat pumps. So we ranked the heat pump efficiency across all the boroughs. We squared that and then we multiplied it by ranked population. So just one to 30 for all the boroughs. This is not the best way to do it for sure, but it is a simple way that models um, how adoption might look in the future. Um, and this is a great area of expansion. Thank you. Well, let's give this team a round of applause.